Over quarantine, I've had a lot of time to think about what frustrates me most. And let me tell you, that's not a really healthy place to be, but it's been kind of interesting because I've learned a lot about my pet peeves. And here's the thing that I like about pet peeves, not just mine, but pet peeves in general, is that pet peeves are really unique things that just frustrate you. They don't have to make sense to other people. Some people might agree with you. They might be like, man, that's, that's the same thing that I have, but they don't have to. So I asked some students to share with me what their pet peeves have been. And, and they were really interesting, so interesting, that I would love to hear, from more of, hear more of them. So, so comment below, you students who are watching this, let's, let's utilize the comment section. I'd love for you to share with me what your unique pet peeves are. So Isabella English from the sixth grade, she's a sixth grade student from the Clear Lake campus. Shout out sixth, sixth grade, shout out to the Clear Lake campus. Really excited about her pet peeves. These are some of the things that she said that just drive her crazy. And, and remember, before you judge, they don't have to make sense to you. They only have to make sense to Isabella. So here's the first thing she said. She says, when I'm sitting with people, when I'm sitting in a room and people are standing up, that's the first thing that frustrated her most. The second one that she says is uh, when younger siblings play too rough. And I really resonate with that last one because I grew up with two younger brothers and they could literally do whatever they wanted to me. But the second I responded, man, I was the one that got in trouble. So thanks, Isabella, for sharing. I really appreciate that. Uh, Mario Bruning, he also shared a couple. He's an 11th grade student from the Egret Bay campus. If you don't know Mario Bruning, I'm pretty sure he's like top 10 athlete in Texas. That may not be true. I may, maybe made that up, but he's really athletic. He's a cool kid. So he said, he gave me three and he ranked them, which I really appreciate. So the three that he said are, here, here, here's, the, here's his third one. He says, people who watch videos in public loudly without headphones is his third worst pet peeve. I don't even know how to say that correctly, but that's what frustrates him a lot is people who watch videos in public loudly without headphones. The second thing he said is when people chew with their mouth open. Mario, I'll go a step further. If you make any chewing noise whatsoever, we're not friends. That's, that's, how, that, that's a pet peeve of mine for sure. And the last thing he says, and this was his most, and I thought this one was really interesting. He says, when people say thanks instead of thank you. Now, I had to ask him, I had to get clarity on what he actually meant because uh, I wasn't sure at first, but I totally get it now. And honestly, Mario, I think that bothers me as well. Uh, and the reason why he said that bothers him is because when someone says just thanks, like if you do something nice for someone and they just respond with thanks, it doesn't sound sincere. But when you say thank you, you're directing your reply towards a specific person. And so I totally get it. I'm with you. That's one of my pet peeves now too. If you don't understand, if you don't get it, that's cool. You don't have to. That's the cool thing about pet peeves. But if I'm going to do something, I expect to receive some type of affirmation or, or credit. Like that's, that's just normal. That's how we function. That's probably why joke thieves bother me so much. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Like when someone takes credit for a joke that they clearly stole from someone else. You know these moments, they're the moments when you're in a group of people and something happens and you turn to one of your friends and you like have the most perfect punchline, but you don't wanna be, you're not obnoxious, so you're, so you're gonna not just like, you speak at a volume that's just loud enough for your friend to hear, but soft enough so you're not taking over the entire conversation. So what does your friend then do? They turn and say exactly the same thing that you just said, just a little bit louder. Everyone laughs and your friend just stands there and says nothing. That drives me crazy. Why? Because that was my joke. That's my humor. And now something, someone else who did nothing for it is receiving all the credit. And I don't think I'm alone here. I think people want to be appreciated for their accomplishments. So why are we talking about this? Well, let's recap a little bit of our series, and I, I think that's going to help us understand. So here, here's where we've been. We're in, we're in the final week of our series called Influencer, where we've been looking at how Christians aren't just called to believe something, but rather they're called to something. The something that they're called to is often referred to as the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So week one, we talked about our influence is grounded in the fact that Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, has called us, right? We find confidence and courage, not because we're capable, but, but because of him who has called us. 
And then the second week, we talked about how an influencer of the kingdom is really one who is a disciple maker. So we talked about what it looked like for you students to prioritize your relationships in such a way that you lead people to see the beauty of Jesus. And that brings you what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about my pet peeve. So let's look at verse 19 once again. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we see the command there, go and make. That's an imperative, meaning it's not optional. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. Christians going and making disciples of every nation. And that includes you. If you call yourself a Christian, that's you. But there's a second command as well. It comes at the end of verse 19. And it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and, the Holy, and of the Holy Spirit. The first command, go and make. The second command is to do it all. As you go and make, do it all in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. This command has to do with your allegiance. You aren't just going rogue and just doing whatever you want. You're not just doing your own thing, but rather you're tethered to something much bigger than yourself. Now, to be honest, students, I want to be honest with you. There's a lot of people who don't like that. In fact, there's, there's people who have grown up in church their entire lives and later abandon their faith because they see imperatives like this one in Scripture. And they begin to feel as if God is selfish and unloving. So this is their thought process. God, you want me to go and make disciples. And last week, we, we just talked about how much work it, a, it actually is to be a disciple maker. Right? You want me to disciple people, love people, sacrifice my wants and my desires for others. But at the end of the day, you're saying that I'm to do it in your name and not my own. You see, people, people say, if God loves me, why is he belittling me? Why does he have to make me feel so small and insignificant? That's not the loving God that we always seem to talk about. That's God boasting in his own accomplishments and taking credit for work that I've truly done. See, if God truly is loving, why does it seem that he is all about himself? Isn't that pride? Can God do the very thing that he asks us not to do? And that type of thinking doesn't just come from this like one passage of scripture, but literally hundreds of them. So I, I, ju I just want to read a few. Isaiah 48, 11, this is what God says. He says, for my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory, I will not give to another. And then 1 Samuel 12, he says this, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make him, to make you a people for himself. And then Ezekiel 36, 22 through 23, he says this, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. See, I read all these passages because I want you to see that God has repeated over and over and over again that everything he does is for his name's sake or to vindicate his holiness so that everyone in, in the entire earth will see that he is above all else. And that includes the things that you do. See, as you disciple people, as you love God and love people, the imperative that we see in Scripture is that you are to do it all in the name of the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. So how does that sit with you? And does that come across as God being some selfish, egocentric being? I mean, if God is so consumed with himself, living for his own glory, focused on his name, taking credit for the work that we do, then how can that God truly be loving as we often say he is? And we think this way, and we think this way about God because we have met people who are extremely selfish. Like we've met people that all they do is talk about their accomplishments and how great they are. They make every conversation about themselves. People who constantly boast in themselves, that people who do that, that constantly boast themselves, they don't typically give a rip about those around us. They don't, they, don't, they don't care about other people. The question that we need to ask is can God be both? Can God be for his own glory and for our good? So let me say that again. Can God be for his own glory 
and then be for a good, like love people at the same time. Because like we already said, people, human beings, we can't do this. We cannot be for our own self and be for other people at the same time. Like I know when I'm selfish and self-promoting, trying to make a name for myself, operating out of the selfish bent, wanting people to see all of my great accomplishments, it's usually at the expense of those around me. So I know that I can't, but can God? Can God be for his own glory and be loving at the same time? Because that's what we see in scripture is that it affirms that God is both. It affirms that God is love and at the same time that it is his desire to see his glory and his fame promoted throughout the, the entire world. So here's what I want to propose. What if God being for his own glory was also God being for your good? So I'm going to use an illustration to help kind of get my point across. A few years ago, um, my wife and I, we took a trip to the Grand Canyon. And let me tell you, it was incredible, life-changing really. And I'm not just exaggerating. It, it took my breath away in like every way possible. Like people had told me that it was awesome and it was wonderful, but seriously, there's truly no way to explain that type of beauty to someone in a way that like actually makes sense and gets your point across. Like it's so massive and grand and, and that made me feel small. Like when I was there, I felt small. But even though I did feel small, I didn't feel threatened by it. Honestly, as I took in the beauty, I felt this overwhelming sense of joy. All I wanted to do was just sit and look at it. And I mean, for hours, my, my wife and I, we just sat there silently. We didn't even talk. Now, now be crazy with me for a second. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something that might sound a little bit crazy. Let's pretend the Grand Canyon had a personality. Like it could communicate. It could talk to us. And let's imagine that the Grand Com Canyon, Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon started promoting its own glory. Like it started repeating over and over and over again, come and see me, I'm worth it. Like he just kept saying that, come and see me, I'm worth it. I personally would have no problem with that. I mean, other than the fact that the Grand Canyon probably will never talk to me, it, it won't. But I would have no problem with that because I've been to the Grand Canyon. I've been to the Grand Canyon and I've seen the beauty of it. And I would tell anyone that it is worth it. It's not lying to you. I would tell people that when you see it, you feel small in comparison to its vastness, but there's this like joy in feeling small when you're there. There's no competing beauties, nothing else that even, nothing else around that really compares to it. So it would not be unloving for the Grand Canyon to promote its own glory and its own beauty because when people go and see it, they would not be disappointed. Why? Because it's worth that much. It delivers on what it promises. Now, what, now let, let me propose a different scenario. What if the Grand Canyon started promoting something different? What if instead of promoting itself, the Grand Canyon told us, go to the garbage dump. It's worth it. I mean, we could perceive that as a, an act of humility, but let me tell you, that's not humility. That's a lie. And not only a lie, but the, the Grand Canyon has just robbed us of the opportunity to see true beauty. How so? Because the garbage dump is not beautiful at all. The Grand Canyon is. And, and the same is true of God. I mean, he made the Grand Canyon. So if it's true of the Grand Canyon, then how much more is it true of the one who created it? When God beckons us, when we read passages of scripture where we find God saying, I will proclaim my glory. I will vindicate my holiness. I will not forsake my name. My glory, I do not give to another. It's like the Grand Canyon saying, come behold my beauty. This is how God being for his own glory is for our good. It is the most loving thing that God could do for us because when we see God in all of his glory, all our longing for true beauty is satisfied forever. It's what we were made for. Students, this is what the Great Commission is all about. This is what it means to make disciples. We come alongside people and say to them, come and see the glory of God. You wanna know where we see that glory most clearly? Let's look at the book of John chapter one, verse 14. He says this, and the word became flesh. That's talking about Jesus. And he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. We see the glory of God most clearly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We see it in the gospel, right? Jesus left heaven so that people would see the glory of God. So at the cross, the glory of God is put on display for the entire world to see. Such beauty and such love and such sacrifice, such glory. Man, when I'm there, I feel small 
and insignificant, but I feel safe. And I just want to sit in his presence where there's no competing beauties because nothing else compares. See, if God promoted anything other than himself, if he gave glory to anything other than himself, it would be like the Grand Canyon promoting a garbage dump. And we would be robbed of the very thing that we were made for. It is, students, it is not unloving for God to promote his own glory because in every way he is truly worth it. This is what the Great Commission is all about. If you want to be an influencer of the kingdom, then go therefore and be a disciple maker. And as you do it, do it all in the name and for the fame of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Students, I invite you to be the voice that beckons people to come and see the glory of God. This is the Great Commission. This is what it means to be a Christian. My life is no longer about promoting myself in lesser beauties. You see, students, we grow up in a culture of self-promotion. Don't lead people to garbage dumps. Lead them to see the vastness of God's mercy and his grace.